section, um, and hopefully more people will filter in as, as we continue. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Edible Inquiries Food Policy Research Connections webinar on the past, present, and future of Farm Bill politics. My name is Rachel Santo, and I'm he, uh, a senior research coordinator here at the Center for Local Future, and in the room with me is Ann Palmer, program director here. This is our second webinar in our Edible Inquiries Food Policy Research Connections series. Each quarter, we invite researchers who have explored topics relevant for food policy groups to present their key findings for discussion with participants about the impact on food policy groups and other research needs. This is part of our broader efforts to cohesively connect researchers and food policy councils with the aim of fostering research that is relevant, proactive, and responsive. Today, we're pleased to welcome two political scientists who have studied the history and interests that give rise to and sustain the Farm Bill over the decades. Christopher Boso is a professor and associate director in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. His areas of research and teaching include food politics and policy, environmental policy, and the governance of emerging technologies. His most recent books are Framing the Food Farm Bill, Interests, Ideology, and the Agricultural Act of 2014, and as editor of Feeding Cities, Improving Local Food Access, Sustainability, and Resilience. Professor Boso also sits on the City of Boston's Food Access Council and on the Advisory Council of the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. Adam Scheingate is a professor and chair of political science at Johns Hopkins University, where he teaches courses on American politics and institutions, including a popular seminar on the politics of food. He has written books and articles on the politics of agriculture in the U.S. and abroad, po policies towards genetically engineered foods in the United States and Europe, and the role of corporate lobbying in U.S. food and agricultural policy. And moderating our discussion today is Mark Winnie, a senior advisor to the Center for Local Future. Mark served as the executive director of, Hartford, of the Hartford Food System, a Connecticut-based nonprofit food organization, from 1979 to 2003. He's also the co-founder of the Community Food Security Coalition, where he worked as the Food Policy Council program director from 2005 to 2012. Mark speaks, trains, and writes on topics related to community food systems, food policy, and food security. Before we begin the presentation, I want to briefly go over a few features of Zoom, the video conferencing and webinar system we're using today. All attendees are muted and will remain in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. At any point during the conversation, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box. You can also open the Q, uh, type it into the chat box as well. You can open the Q&A and chat boxes on the floating toolbar, either at the top or bottom of your screen. And we'll be addressing these questions throughout as well as at the end of the webinar. And if you have any issues with sound or viewing the slides, please send us a message via the chat, also located on. And we will be recording the webinar today and sharing the slides after the presentation. And last but not least, as mentioned before, the webinar is being hosted by the Center for a Livable Future an interdisciplinary center located at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our work focuses on the intersections of diet, the environment, food production, and public health. The Food Policy Networks Project is one of our projects with the goal to build the capacity of food system stakeholders to reform local, state, regional, and tribal food systems through effective public policy. We do that through training, sharing best practices, networking with other food policy groups and leaders, and developing and providing food policy resource materials. If you're not familiar with the Food Policy Networks Project, I encourage you to check out our website and to sign up to our listserv to hear about future webinars. Thank you all for being here to talk with us today. I'll now turn it over to Mark to start the conversation. Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everybody. Uh, we have an opportunity today to hear from two leading political scientists who are going to help and help us it's sort of the never ending task of understanding the farm bill. Um, one thing that I've always found fascinating about the farm bill is the way that it brings together and then sometimes divides different forces and interests within our food system. Uh, I had an opportunity perhaps, I think it was back in 1985, for my very first time of trying to understand what the political, social, economic dynamics are. Uh, that have shaped the farm bill. Um, and since then, it's only gotten more complicated and it's uh, certainly become more interesting. So we have the, we have the good fortune to have uh, 
Adam Schreingate and uh, Chris Basso here with us today to give us some of that, that history, some of that political background, and also to help us understand what the current uh, political dynamics are. And thinking about this from the point of view of someone involved with food policy councils and working in local and state food policy, I think it's very important for us to think, how can we shape the Farm Bill? How can we be most effective with regard to that task? And um, knowing the history, as they always say, is important. And knowing where we're at right now in terms of our the numerous political scenarios that we face, I think will help us in that task. So uh, I'm going to open it up right away. And uh, we're going we're to start with Adam to uh, the presentation. And just to note, uh, uh, each, each of these folks will be speaking for about 15 minutes. And we're going to take, if we have a couple of questions after Adam speaks, we'll take those. And uh, before we go on to hear from Chris. Uh, so keep in mind your questions, please write them down and submit them as you're listening to Adam or later on, uh, we'll have a fuller discussion uh, when Chris, after Chris is done. So Adam, take it away, please. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really excited to be participating um, in this webinar, and, and thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite honored to be considered, uh, along with Chris, uh, a top political scientist um, studying the Farm Bill. Uh, we may be the only political scientist studying the Farm Bill, so uh, that's, that's how we ended up in the top two. Um, but that actually proves a larger point, which is that uh, the people who tend to pay the most attention to the Farm Bill are those who benefit the most, most directly from those programs, uh, particularly agricultural subsidies and others. And that's, I think, an important lesson on political power that hopefully people uh, will, uh, will pick up on over the course of our conversation is that uh, the more people who are paying attention to the Farm Bill, the more people who are uh, engaged uh, in activism around the Farm Bill, the more likely the, the goals and priorities of the Farm Bill will change to reflect the broader diversity of interests at stake in the Farm Bill. And part of the problem is that uh, so few people understand what's going on in the Farm Bill and, there, and also because so few people have the uh, resources uh, to focus on the ongoing uh, sort of insider game of Farm Bill politics. So um, I'm going to run through a few a few things quickly around um, around the farm bill to, to pr provide some background. Maybe maybe this is stuff that people uh, might know already, but it, I think it'll still help kind of um, kind of set the set the stage. So um, uh, so to begin with, um, uh, I'm just going to pull up a slide here um, that um, uh, begins to think about what's what is in uh, the Farm Bill, and, and a lot is in the Farm Bill. I would say that um, it's kind of a, a behemoth, a legislative behemoth now, that includes a whole bunch of different programs uh, and, and policies. And um, uh, what you see here are a selection of the big categories of, 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 uh, of titles in the Farm Bill around crop commodity programs. Those are subsidies for, for major row crops like corn and wheat and cotton nutrition programs, particularly around the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, crop insurance programs that indemnify farmers against losses as well uh, uh, as these uh, commodity programs, uh, rural development policies, energy programs, particularly around um, tax incentives for ethanol refiners, uh, conservation programs, which on the one hand are designed to um, uh, incentivize farmers from adopting certain practices, but also historically were used to try to contain or cap or reduce production as a way to boost uh, prices. And then of course, policies around um, specialty crops, organic agriculture, and the like. Again, a lot of stuff goes into the Farm Bill, and one of the things I wanna talk about in the next few minutes is sort of why so much goes into the Farm Bill. Uh, when uh, most folks probably think of the Farm Bill as, as really focused on farming and really focused on the uh, programs and subsidies that are uh, uh, um, oriented towards larger producers of major row crops, corn, cotton, wheat, soy, and the like. Uh, so uh, one thing uh, that I would um, 
point to here is that if we look at the money spent um, on farm income stabilization, which are these subsidies, and compare that to the money spent on nutrition programs, um, this figure kind of tells the story of the changing politics of the farm bill, uh, which is that, um, an, that the programs uh, of commodity programs, the um, uh, farm subsidies, those really go back to the Great Depression, the 1930s, when we started intervening directly in agricultural markets. And uh, that structured agricultural policy really for uh, uh, 30, 30 years or so, 40 years or so. And gradually that really transformed farming in the United States. Um, these programs along with um, the availability of, um, agricultural, of uh, industrial inputs, machinery, chemicals, hybrid seeds, transformed farming so that it, um, it, it took fewer farmers to produce more and more food in the United States. Why is that important politically? Well, because uh, in order to get legislation passed, you have to construct a majority. And over time, there were fewer and fewer farmers in the country, fewer and fewer representatives in Congress who came from districts that had a predominant agricultural basis to their economy. Um, we could talk about the Senate later and how that uh, maybe overrepresents rural areas. But what you begin to see in the 1960s and in the early 1970s is a very conscious decision to combine legislation on agricultural subsidies with legislation on nutrition programs. First food stamps, uh, which come about in the 1960s and then really put in place in the early 1970s. And then that becomes a snap uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the 2000s. Um, the key point here is that a coalition or a log roll as we call it in political science was struck between rural interests in Congress and urban interests in Congress. Uh, and that coalition was bipartisan. It included Democrats and Republicans. And the idea there was that urban members of Congress would support agricultural subsidies in exchange for rural support of uh, food stamps and other nutrition programs. And that was a very stable coalition for many years. And it still really structures the discussion and debate over agricultural subsidies uh, and nutrition programs that are the heart of the Farm Bill. But as you can see over time, um, our spending on nutrition programs is really much more than our spending on, um, on um, agricultural subsidies. And to put it in even bigger perspective, this still constitutes a fairly small portion of the federal budget. So if you see in this, uh, this pie chart um, on your left, that shows sort of overall government outlays by function. And you know, food and nutrition uh, programs are, are less than 3% of the budget. Agricultural subsidies are less than 1% of the budget. If you put those things together, uh, or if you, I'm sorry, if you break those things apart in terms of, the, in terms of food and nutrition spending, about 75% of, um, of spending is on these nutrition programs, um, about 25% on commodity programs, uh, crop insurance, and conservation. And that, again, we'll talk about this more, I think, hopefully in the Q&A, but this really structures the politics uh, of the Farm Bill today. Again, keep in mind that the number of representatives in Congress who benefit a great deal from these agricultural subsidies is, is declining because of, the, uh, because of the fact that we have fewer farmers and critically because um, these agricultural subsidies are really concentrated in the largest producers in the, particularly in the grain belt of the United States, uh, in the largest farms. So, um, uh, for example, to give uh, some statistics, um, farms, very, very large farms that sell a million or more of product each year are only about 4% of farms in the United States. But they account for 30% of all the subsidies paid in the United States. And they account for about two thirds of all of the value of agricultural production in the United States. So these agricultural subsidies are particularly of interest to these very, very large farms. They're also of interest to the food industry that uses corn and soy as inputs in processed foods. Um, and as a result, the politics of the Farm Bill require the construction of these coalitions uh, with the advocates of nutrition programs and also of the advocates for all those, some of those smaller programs um, that, I, that I mentioned before. Um, so uh, what we've seen 
recently is um, it becoming harder and harder to maintain this coalition. And, um, and that's because of, of a few factors. One factor is uh, changes in the composition of the two political parties. So that when the coalition was struck in the 19, when the bargain was struck in the 1960s and 1970s, there were, there were a sizable number of rural Democrats as well as rural Republicans who benefited from these commodity programs. Because of changes in American politics that have taken place over the last 30 to 40 years, there are now today very, very few rural Democrats in the House um, and, um, and and rural areas generally vote Republican. So Democrats are um, are less focused, I, I suppose, or, 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 or their constituents benefit less from these agricultural subsidies. In the meantime, the Republican Party over the last 15, 20 years has moved to the right, and become more conservative. And in particular, a significant segment of the Republican Party on the far right of that party are particularly hostile towards uh, nutrition programs and have made it a priority to try to reduce or, um, uh, or, or significantly scale back spending on nutrition programs and, and, uh, and limit eligibility for those programs. And that essentially has broken the bargain uh, that sustained farm bill politics for so long. And so instead of having this kind of bipartisan agreement between Republicans and Democrats that will support both farm subsidies and food stamps, we're now in a very uh, partisan battle between Democrats trying to hold the line on food stamps or uh, SNAP, I should say, uh, and Republicans who are basically divided in their caucus between those who want to maintain subsidies for their rural constituents, but also are uh, being pulled to the right on these ideological commitments to reduce uh, to reduce spending on on SNAP. So, um, so what does that uh, mean, I guess, for um, for the contemporary politics of the Farm Bill? Well, this is just looking at some of the changes that are being proposed for the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, on the left, the, the Senate bill, which has just come out of committee. On the right, the, the proposal that came through the House. Um, there's a lot here, and I just want to point out uh, a few things. One is that um, in terms of overall spending, uh, very little changes. In fact, slight increases in chain, slight increases in spending being proposed of about, um, in the Senate, about a little over a billion dollars over five years, and in the and then, and then the House, a little over $3 billion. Um, the House bill actually, as it's been scored, or as the S Congressional Budget Office has assessed the spending projections for the next five years, the House bill actually um, would increase spending by about $1.7 billion. Why is that? Well, the House bill proposes um, work requirements, which would reduce eligibility and reduce the number of beneficiaries uh, for SNAP, but would require um, administrative spending in order to implement these changes that would actually increase the overall cost of nutrition programs. And I think that's something that's important perhaps for this audience to think about as you're discussing um, uh, strategies around uh, uh, advocacy. Uh, to point out that the House bill is not going to save any money at all. It's just going to shift money from beneficiaries to the government, which actually runs counter to what most conservatives say they want to do with respect to government spending. So I think that's an important thing uh, to, to point out. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll sort of end on before I hand it over to Mark and then, and then to Chris um, is that there's a lot of other constituents uh, in, in SNAP um, uh, and that also, I think, um, I, I think creates a, a maybe a, a, a politics that is not perhaps always um, always seen. Um, I think Chris will, will agree, and he'll he'll be able to go into this in, in more detail. Then that the that the proposals to cut back on SNAP uh, that have been proposed in the House and passed in the House are very unlikely to pass Congress. That in fact, you're gonna get a bill that's much closer to the Senate version. And then the question politically is, what actually can get through uh, the conference committee and then be passed in the same form in both the House and the Senate versions, which is required for something to move on for signature uh, by the president. Again, just thinking about SNAP for a moment is that um, there are a lot of stakeholders in the SNAP program um, 
that once we have a farm bill that uh, approves the budget, uh, that approves spending on, on SNAP, it has to be administered in the states. Uh, we can talk about how different states might approach uh, restrictions on eligibility and do so in a way that might actually reduce the impact. And again, from an advocacy perspective, you, you might want to think about what strategies you can pursue in your individual states that would uh, diminish or dampen the effect of those changes, wh wh whether the, uh, how they take shape. But also to realize that there are very powerful stakeholders who benefit from the status quo as it relates to SNAP. Uh, banks that receive transaction fees on SNAP debit uh, transactions or EBT transactions, um, they have a stake in SNAP. Uh, large retailers like Walmart or large grocery chains, they have a stake in the status quo because so many of their sales are through SNAP redemptions. And then of course, large, uh, the, the food industry also benefits from policies that in their current uh, form, don't make any, don't place any restrictions on how, uh, or very few restrictions on how beneficiaries can spend that money. And in a sense, the, the, the SNAP program, in some sense, is subsidizing purchases of their products. So it's hard to know exactly how those very powerful interests like Walmart or Coca-Cola are mobilizing around SNAP, but research on their spending on lobbying suggests they are engaged. And one might suspect that they're doing so in a way that would, uh, look to reduce or dampen uh, the effect of, um, of, po of potential uh, restrictions. And then lastly, as I hand it, o as I hand it over, I, I like to use a, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of uh, metaphor to describe the, the, to describe the farm bill, which again may be of interest to this audience, which is, you know, if you think about all the money that's going into these uh, big subsidy programs and, and all of the money that's being spent on lobbying the farm bill by these powerful interests, these powerful commodity groups and the food industry and the like. I, I sort of think of the farm bill as this big stumbling drunk that's kind of careening down the halls of Congress with sort of dollar bills sort of falling out of its pocket, you know, coming out of its pocket, dropping pennies along the way. And, um, and in a sense, those pennies that the farm bill is dropping along the way are the pennies that go to a variety of important programs that find their way back to local communities to support, um, you know, increasing access to farmers markets or um, uh, or funding um, incentive programs for SNAP purchases of fruits and vegetables that, in the big scheme of things, are not really a really small change, but. Um, in the current environment where we have these very sharp partisan divisions and where it's going to be just a matter of a few votes that decides whether or not the farm bill passes ultimately in the House uh, and the Senate, those, the ability to advocate for those small programs might be enough to get the, the one or two votes required to get this, the farm bill over the line. So it really is worth focusing on members of Congress who are supportive of those smaller programs that are kind of under the radar, so to speak, but would be a really important part of a coalition that ultimately has to come together to pass a farm bill at a time when it's very likely that a significant number of Republicans in the House will end up voting against the final bill because of its, um, because it doesn't go far enough for them on, on SNAP. So, the struggles over SNAP actually, I think, open possibilities for advocacy around smaller programs that could really channel significant resources to local communities. And I'll leave it there and hand it back to Mark. Well, thank you, Adam. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, this always makes me conclude once again that the farm bill process makes for strange bedfellows. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask you one question with that just jumped out at me when you were speaking. And it was that uh, you know, the fact that there's so few Democrats in rural uh, rural uh, districts these days, which sort of changes or influences the political dynamics. But one thing that you alluded to in that your, your drunken lobbyist stumbling down the quarters of Congress metaphor is that uh, you know, there are those who are picking up the, the pennies that are falling out. And um, it does occur to me that there are more Democrats who are supporting those, those programs that are the regional local food system, small programs, uh, which 
really often don't even make it to the radar. Uh, is does that is that significant in the sense of you know a shift, political shift that you know there that Democrats are are not going to necessarily be as invested in the sort of traditional farm programs, but are going to be more invested in those smaller uh, food system, regional food system type programs. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, I think that certainly some Democrats are more receptive to um, uh, to shifting policy towards these regional food system goals. Um, I think you know, relative to their concern over SNAP, it's still a it's still a, a fairly small number. But in some cases, you know, the way Congress works is that uh, within the specific committees of Congress and even within the subcommittees of Congress, having one of those champions can be really important for getting those provisions in in the bill. And so I think that's where there has been. Um, there, ha there, there are champions in the Democratic Party, uh, both in the House and the Senate, who are willing, um, who are willing to advance those goals. And that I think that does, you know, I, I think that does signal a shift. I, I think the, you know, in the longer term, um, and this is I'm not I'm not sort of pro uh, prognosticating or predicting, but I think as a goal, uh, the question would be how um, how one might advance. A, a coalition that uh, that finds more uh, more Democrats willing to ch to champion these these regional food systems and figure out um, how to advocate effectively uh, for goals that combine kind of community food security goals that are represented you know through nutrition programs as well as other programs along with regional food system goals to kind of change sort of change the narrative. And, and I think move us away from the traditional log roll, which is like, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, I vote for subsidies for these major row crops, you vote for SNAP, and instead, you know, shift the, shift the discussion away from um, kind of the large in, uh, productivist agriculture goals and say, here's this alternative uh, set of goals that embraces community food security and regional food systems that we can build a coalition on. And in, in fact, maybe even pull in Republicans who are more receptive to the kind of uh, local food system, regional food system um, uh, 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 goals that are not uh, driven so much by um, national policy as much. That's something we might talk about some more too. Well, great, that sounds promising. Do we, question, do we have any questions, Anna, Rachel, from the audience? I don't, nothing right now. So if you guys have anything, um, go ahead and put it in the chat box or the Q&A. So I think you guys can, um, looks like we're good to go. Okay, then we'll move ahead uh, with Chris. Again, thank you, Adam. And uh, you know, Chris is uh, going to add, I know, considerably to our discussion. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. To make sure. I've had a funky uh, uh, internet. So hello everybody, uh, Adam has done a great job in setting this up and what I'm going to do is uh, really talk a bit, you know, fill in some spaces that he, he started with. Um, oh, on a second, I'm, I apologize, I screwed up my screen share. All right, there we are. Can everybody see me? Yep. All right, let me uh, do the uh, slideshow here. There, all right. Um, Adam really set this up very well. What I want to do is sort of fill in some spaces and amplify a bit on what he started and also offer some context, again, for the audience who are interested in advocacy strategies, um, some of the context about the Farm Bill that make advocacy strategies that much clearer um, in some cases and helps you understand some of the dynamics that go along in Farm Bill politics. So I think it's important there's a couple facts I'm gonna lay out, and I'm a little more text heavy in my slides, and I apologize for that. Um, but there's a couple of things I wanna point out that many people may not realize about the Farm Bill that really structure how the politics plays out. Each Farm Bill is technically a reauthorization of the permanent law. That is the 1938, 39, 49 Agricultural Adjustment Acts. That is, unlike most pieces of congressional legislation, um, Congress, when it actually takes up the Farm Bill, is reauthorizing what is called the permanent law. Um, and, you know, and the, the framers of the original Farm Bills did this on purpose. 
for reasons I'll get to in a second. This is pretty rare. I mean, you only have, the, maybe only the transportation bill has the same kind of sunsetting provisions in it that revert back to permanent law if you don't reauthorize years. So why does it matter? Well, if, if you don't reauthorize the farm bill, theoretically by the end of this September, when the current farm bill, version of the farm bill expires, legal authority and spending for the programs that are not listed in the permanent law lapse. They don't have they don't have formal authorization. You can't spend money unless it's formally authorized. Now, you know, Congress could do a continued resolution, which I'll get to in a little bit, but you know, there's sort of that hammer of the, you know, the sort of end of September being a sort of deadline that drives a lot of what's gonna be so and also the rules on me, the commodities that are in for example, wheat, dairy, permanent, if, if they revert back to some permanent law rules back, set back in the 1930s, and nobody wants to go there. There's a lot of horror stories that what might happen if the farm bill doesn't get renewed, and that certain commodity prices would triple overnight, especially dairy, although not this time necessarily. Um, but, you know, so in theory, what happens if the farm bill does You are yeah. um, fading. You're fading yeah. out for some reason. Yeah, I know. This weird internet connection. I'm sorry about that. You hear me? Yep. Now yeah. I can. So you know, and what's important to the audience here is that most of the programs you all care about in this audience are not in the permanent law. Stuff you care about will lapse theoretically um, if it's not renewed. Now the farm block keeps this clause in the farm bill to keep the farm bill issues on the agenda, to make sure that if, you know, the, that deadline will force people into compromises in theory, um, and to get farm bill passage. Now that's sort of the whole point, is that is this deadline is like a, to force everybody to get together, talk about these issues, and get a compromise, get something done. Now, ironically, and we've seen this in the last few farm bills, the same provision, also makes it easier to hold a farm bill hostage. Um, I think we've seen this in immigration in the House. That is, you know, you get other players, and Adam, you know, understands this as well with the big players. You get other players with other issues, whether it's immigration or trade or, you know, or budget balancing, like it happened in the last farm bill, holding the farm bill hostage to other issues. And increasingly, the traditional coalition is not powerful enough to resist those dynamics of others holding the farm bill hostage. So, you know, so that same deadline that forces people to actually work with each other also works against the farm bill sometimes, farm bill uh, proponents sometimes, because it also enables them to hold it hostage. Um, an important point for those who care about SNAP, uh, I mean, along with, you know, the SNAP, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. A lot of the programs, as I said, that you all care about, conservation, organics, earth, Chris, you cut out again. Sorry, I'm just, I'll am just. i try the best I can. Uh, Congress right yeah. pass a resolution um, if it so wishes. It probably will. If it doesn't get it done by this September, it probably will pass a continuing resolution. All right, let's get to the next, next important point. Um, why SNAP is in the Farm Bill? Now, Adam alluded to this. Let me give, make a couple of observations here why this is important. Origins go back to a New Deal pilot project to use of farm surpluses. I mean, you need to understand that from the farm, farm blocks perspective, SNAP and nutrition programs are as much important to using up surplus commodities as anything else. So that effect that also feeds hungry people is a bonus. But for, for those who in the farm block, they care about SNAP because it is also aimed at using up commodities. Productive, and there's no restrictions on their production. If you don't restrict production, you got pluses. So the SNAP program was always designed in a way to use up to, to enable low-income people to, to buy food, but it uses up surpluses. And that increasingly, as Adam alluded to, um, you know that the SNAP program became the linchpin of the farm block uh, coalition that began in the 60s as urban America grew in importance.
farming district. Um, beginning in the 60s and really beginning in the 70s, you began to see this farm programs plus food stamps marriage in Congress that really have held this together for 40, 50 years. Um, and, and again, and you'll hear a lot of talk of the Trump administration want to reorganize the social welfare state. I can guarantee you that the farm block is not going to really let SNAP program leave the USDA and, and the SNAP program's jurisdiction leave the agriculture committees. There's, they're not going to allow that to happen because that is a $70 billion uh, you know, area for them to care about, but also it's jurisdiction over you know, the SNAP program as a farm program as they see it. They just see it as another farm program, like a commodity. So the Congressional Farm Block sees nutrition programs as essential to its coalition um, and is bargained and as, and as pointed out, the log rolling that has occurred is that the rural conservatives who normally are opposed to welfare will support SNAP spending in return for urban constituencies so who would Chris, out again. And this, you know, by by the way, politically speaking, if you're a SNAP promoter, if you're defending SNAP programs, if the Farm Bill lapses at the end of September, SNAP does not. SNAP's an entitlement program under a separate piece of legislation, the, the Food Stamp Act. So theoretically, you know, the, even if it's, let, this in theory, if the Farm Bill uh, ends at the end of September and it's not reauthorized, SNAP continues. Which means that if you're a SNAP dander, you have very little incentive to support a farm bill that harms your program, you know, at all. You know, you have the whole card here in some respects. You're going to hold tight, and unless the, 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 the less the less SNAP is preserved, you have no incentive to play ball, you know, on the farm bill without those guarantees. All right, let me let me talk about the politics real quickly of all this. And Adams alluded to some of this. Um, the erosion in the farm block and its political leverage in Congress is the story of the last 50 years. Um, the near disappearance of rural Democrats in Congress, they've been replaced by rural conservative Republicans. They've always been conservative, but instead of rural Democrat, conservative rural Democrats, you have conservative rural Republicans. And that is important because as I'll show in a few slides, those rural Democrats used to be a bridge between the two parties, especially on farm bill negotiations. And we've had the realignment of representation in Congress, the politics of what I call homogenous spaces, it, especially among Republicans. They represent very homogenous districts, mostly white, mostly conservative, especially in the Midwest, South and Southwest. Um, and these days, as any Congress scholar can tell you, there's very few marginal districts, that is competitive districts. Chris, you just cut out again. Republican. Yeah, so there's very few of these marginal districts left, which means you have very homogenous, um, you know, kind of spaces. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So the result is probably part, the result, and again, for political scientists, this is ironic because political scientists used to talk about the need for responsible parties, and now we got them. So the result is party cohesion that we haven't seen since late 19th century, and polarization between the parties. Let me, and let me show you what this looks like over time and why it matters to coalition building and lobbying strategies. So next seven slides are gonna cover 50 years of house voting behavior. Here's the 1960s. So what you see in the 60s, and these are basically votes by the percentage of, on the, on the, on the sort of x-axis, so as the sort of vertical axis is, you know, voting cohesion, within party that is you know and then the, the, the y-axis is sort of liberal versus conservative so you have a bunch of folks in the middle there you know who are essentially quote moderates moderate republicans moderate democrats a lot of them rural in the 1960s and they were sort of the glue that held together the farm bills and other legislation in many cases so let me go real quickly of the next 50 years and you're going to see what happens here's the set here's the 60s here's the 70s the 80s, the 90s, right? you see the pattern, the 2000s. Here's 2011, 2012. The one poor orange dot in the middle, uh, it was some member of Congress from New York. Um, and this is what it looks like now. What, what does that mean? There's nobody in the middle. The parties are totally, you know, if you, talk, if you say that there's no difference between the parties, you're not paying attention. 
The Republican Party is a conservative party. The Democratic Party is a liberal party. And there's almost nobody in the middle. And when there's nobody in the middle, it's very hard to forge coalitions. You know, the, the substance of coalition building is difficult to make when essentially there's a big gap between the parties. Okay, so having established that point, let's get it what it adds up to right now. Um, and this sort of again echoes something the, ad, the ad, points that Adams have made. Adams made the erosion in the political clout of the farm block means they are no longer in as much control as they used to be. In fact, I would argue, and Adam would I think agree, that in the House in particular, what's left of the farm block doesn't have control over the farm bill. You know, power in the House is with the Republican majority, most of whom are not all that supportive of spending, especially the Freedom Caucus conservatives. They don't like spending on SNAP or commodity programs. You know, so, you know, so the farm block folks, people on the ad committee are the minority now, especially among Republicans. And the Democrats on the agriculture committee are there because of SNAP, not because of commodity programs. So, you know, um, you know, SNAP is still the story, but increasingly it's a divisive story because of the ideological differences over SNAP between the parties. What you have now is the dominance of exurban and suburban Republicans in the House. That's where the po center of population is now, especially for Republicans. Urban Democrats are mostly of an urban party. Um, so the House can pass, as we saw last week, with you know, the House can pass a farm bill without a single Democratic vote. Right, it barely passed last week by two votes after having gone down to flames a month ago on the House floor, the second time this has happened in the last two farm bills. And the fight there was among Republicans. Republicans can pass a farm bill without Democrats in the House, but that version, as Adam has already pointed out, won't get past the Senate. There's no way. Because Senate passage requires 60 votes, and the Democrats have leverage in the Senate. Moreover, Senators represent broader, more diverse constituencies than do House members. Even you know, if you're a, a, a relatively conservative Republican in the Senate, you still have cities in your state. You still have people who are you know, interested in nutrition programs more. Um, you know, so the senators are more accustomed to navigating these coalitions because they have broader constituencies. And the structure of the Senate overrepresents rural America, as we know. So if the farm block has any defense left, it's in the Senate. So, you know, you're not going to see the same dynamic in the Senate, which is, by the way, engaged right now on debate in the Farm Bill right now on the Senate floor. The Senate is going to be a very different game than the House. So there's no chance, very little chance, I would say, perhaps no, there's little chance of a Farm Bill passing the Senate without nutrition programs. The House version is dead on arrival in the Senate. So what's going to We lost you. For, um, sorry about that. For those in the audience, the promoters of other programs, you know, you know, local food system programs, organics, you know, SNAP bounty bucks, all those kinds of things that you care about should focus on Senate and on the conference committee as the sort of leverage points. Um, so that's where we are right now, I would say, with the Farm Bill and the rea reality of what Congress looks like today. And I'll let it go with that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Sorry, and you. No, it's. I think. I think we got most of it, and yeah. uh, it's particularly that that di the division, the the gap between uh, Republican Democrat, Democrats. Yeah. Mark, and tells us a, a very dramatic story. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. You were breaking up a little bit. I was breaking up. All right. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, do we have any questions at this point, uh, uh, Ann or Rachel? No questions yet. I, yeah. So, so one thought I had in uh, listening to you, Chris, was the, uh, you know, with the potential for these, for various maybe new uh, alignments that might take place in the future. I mean, it's interesting to note that, um, I mean, that, Speaking of farm interests having a stake in SNAP and rural uh, Republicans having a stake in uh, the you know farm interests.
structure in their in their own districts. Is there any potential for new uh, coalitions that might form politically? Um, uh, yeah, Democrats I mean, working with rural Republicans around potential yeah. farm bill changes, or even just holding the line at the very least. Well, I think to echo Adam, I think there are opportunities here. I mean, that, you know, maybe not the House so much right now, given the just sheer gap between the two parties. But on some issues, there are. I mean, and again, these are areas where people may disagree. But for example, uh, there is, I think, some bipartisan, uh, you know, sort of feeling in the House you know, about uh, restricting SNAP, SNAP recipients from using SNAP dollars for sugar sweetened sodas. I mean, there are some of that, you know, and, you know, some argue that's paternalism of both types, but, you know, you can see some on nutrition programs, shaping nutrition programs. I think organics offer an opportunity uh, in many cases. There's a, a lot more interest in organics, I think, in the, in the farm sector than there used to be. Now, remember, by organic, I don't mean necessarily small local stuff that we tend to think of. Remember, a lot of organic is big industrial organic. So, you know, I mean, Walmart is not buying its organics from small artisanal farms. Um, so, you know, there are interests in organic, there are interests in nutrition program. You know, again, I think a lot of the stuff that we, we look at here um, are more likely to get sort of shaped in the Senate right, at this point in time than in the House. I mean, Debbie Stabenow and the Senate Ag Committee is very good at getting those programs in the farm bill. And Pat Roberts, you know, on, from Kansas, you know, he's, he's classic old school, old commodity program, but he's very amenable to including those kinds of programs in the farm bill if it gets him the votes on the Senate floor. And so, um, you know, the folks who are defending the traditional farm bill coalitions are, you know, they're very much of, you know, sort of the classic, what do you want? Is it going to get another vote? Include me at the table. And so I think for, you know, I think coalition building uh, in the future can get really interesting in terms of promoters of more urban, more local food systems, you know, as they get leverage, especially in the Senate, among De Senate not just Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans as well. Uh, and somewhat in the House. I mean, again, though, the margin in the House is so, you know, there's, the polarization is so great that it's a little bit more, a little harder there to see that kind of coalition building working in the set, in the House without SNAP. I mean, SNAP is still the glue that holds things together in the House, or at least to some extent, um, and in the Senate. But these other kinds of programs are increasingly important as they equal votes. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Kirsten Gillibrand in New York and, you know, other senators coming from states with large urban populations, but also large, you know, farming uh, sectors care about the sort of combination of these things much more than we would imagine. Yeah. Uh, Adam, do you have any thoughts you want to add to that? I mean, yeah, I, I agree with everything Chris said. I, I think, um, you know, an interesting uh, you know, an interesting thing to think about in terms of uh, what would a new coalition look like um, is if, um, you know, some group of Democrats and Republicans came together around more broadly rural concerns. And, and if you sort of rhetorically shift from agriculture policy to rural policy, you know, I could, I mean, it would be interesting to see if that opens up possibilities mm -hmm. down the road. Um, yeah. I would also say that, you know, again, this is this is highly speculative, but, um, you know, one scenario that um, that is at least in the realm of possibility, although I think Chris made some very compelling reasons why this this won't happen. But, you know, what happened in 2013 after the House was unsuccessful in passing a farm bill is they did split the, the commodity program title from the nutrition program title and they passed separate bills because they knew they could construct separate majorities for those bills. Now, they also knew that they were gonna be joined back together in the Senate, so it was essentially a free vote. But, you know, again, I, it's, it's unlikely that this happens, but if we eventually reach a point where these, this, this, um, this bipartisan, this, this coalition, this, this uh, uh, log roll no longer exists, then in some sense it creates a possible opportunity to construct a new coalition around rural concerns as well as food security concerns. Again, I'm, I'm not sure what 
probability I would place on that happening, probably pretty low, but it's an interesting alternative to consider and to kind of um, play out uh, strategically what that might look like. Yeah, I, I, let me echo it, Adam. I, I think that's a possibility, but not under the current Republican uh, leadership. I mean, I think this is this, not to sound, this is not a partisan statement. I think it's more, if the Democrats retook the House, then I think the opportunities for kind of, these kind of bargains are greater because the Democrats are less driven by ideology than by interests. I mean, in many respects, as a party, comparatively speaking, the Republican Party, for good or ill, is really an ideological party. Now, they may fight over what truth and beauty is, but that's an ideological party. Democrats traditionally have been more interest-based or, you know, coalition-based, different groups. Um, and as a result, it might be easier for a House Speaker or and a, and a House Ad Committee led by Democrats to proceed in those kind of ways that Adam's talking about than for a Republican. I just don't see the the opportunities for Republicans to do this under their leadership. But under Democrats, it's not because of virtue, just because of the nature of the coalition, um, may be more possible to construct these new kinds of coalitions based maybe, I think your I, Adam's point about rural development or rural issues is a good one. You know, we should not yeah. conflate farm issues with rural issues. They're two different things. Yeah, and rural development as, a, as an emphasis could be a, a positive direction yeah. that would build a, a bipartisan yeah. coalition. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm making the assumption that you know, we're largely today among uh, Democrats. Um, I wonder if you had any advice for us in terms of uh, you know, how, how do we talk about these issues? How can we reach out? Um, you know, take a Republican to lunch comes to mind, um, maybe, or take a Republican to your farmer's market. Uh, any thoughts on, on how we might uh, stretch ourselves, uh, get a, maybe even get ourselves out of our own uh, comfort zones and uh, see what else we could do. Well, go ahead, Adam. You want to go first? Uh, I was just going to say that, you know, one, one thing that there's, um, so if you were to look at the distribution of, of agricultural subsidies um, for these big commodity programs, the corn, wheat, soy, uh, cotton program, that um, they are highly concentrated in Republican districts, okay? That's not the case for SNAP. SNAP actually is distributed quite broadly across Democratic and Republican districts. And so, again, one of the, one of the things I think um, advocates of nutrition programs uh, are, are hopefully doing is to remind Republican uh, legislators and, and also, in particular, uh, Republican um, office holders in individual states that they have a significant number of constituents who are... Um, who, uh, who benefit from nutrition programs uh, and who would be harmed by, um, by the proposed changes that um, are being discussed. And that, um, you know, it goes back to, to Chris's point that it's, it's, it's really ideological reasons that, um, that's, that work requirements have risen up on the agenda. And, you know, this used to be a pretty fringe viewpoint on the right and like other things it's now become mainstream but it is at odds with um the, the sort of uh i would say constituency interests of republican office holders uh particularly those from poor areas in in rural parts of the united states where um there is a very um great need for nutrition uh programs um yeah. and and it would be worth reminding them of, of that and again yeah. i also want to emphasize how important the states are in this because the states are the ones implementing uh, SNAP um, and um, and would be on the hook, so to speak, for implementing work requirements, and uh, and the and that is going to that would, if passed, create an, a real administrative t uh, burden on those states. Yeah, yeah, and I would follow. Yeah, I, I think that conversation. Go ahead, Chris. But I think if I was, and I think the conversations are being had. I mean, I think we forget that you know, there are food policy sort of councils emerging in otherwise Republican states. You know, people, it's not just Democratic cities or states where p interest in food has just exploded. You know, I think that we mistakenly think that way sometimes. I think this is a coastal thing somehow. Uh, and it's not. I mean, I think that, uh, and people get it. I think what's important is trying to figure out the space where these conversations can occur. I mean, SNAP, as long as it's simply seen as a, as a welfare program, you know, becomes ideological uh, or, 
organics or any other program, if it seems to be a one-dimensional thing, it gets to be ideological. But if, you know, there's plenty of conservative Republicans who worry about the, the, what's happening to the land, to oil and air um, from overuse of pesticides. I mean, so these are conversations that are happening. Um, and so trying to figure out, you know, how those spaces, how to create those spaces is important. Um, so I think the, the, how you frame these things is that, you know, food's too important to become ideological. What are the areas of commonality that we have? I mean, SNAP is a, you know, one could argue that it's the lousiest way to create a nutrition program. But, all right, what's your alternative? You know, you know the, the box of commodities. So if you're going to have a, you know, you know obviously we could just give people cash, but we don't want to do that either, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, so, you know, how do you create a better program that meets the nutritional needs of those who are in need and also meets the broader needs of community, of a society to understand that its dollars are being well spent? I mean, those are legitimate discussions people should have. Now, and I think Adam's right. I mean, a lot of the work rule issues have become non-starters because of the perception that it's just piling on people who already have, are at, the, at, sort of the, at, the, at the end of the margins anyway. So how do you create a, a, a programs that appeal to a broad array of people that make sense to them? And I think those are the narratives we should be thinking about. I don't have anything more specific than that. So it does, yeah. so it does sound like there's some opportunity for conversation oh, yeah. across the aisles and oh, yeah. uh, to bridge some of the ideological gaps, perhaps, because there is common ground. That's, that's clearly what you're suggesting. I mean, I think the typical uh, thing do we have is any, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. No, go ahead. Finish your thought. I think, I think the difficult thing in the House right now, in particular, is that um, you know, again, the, in some respects, the Republicans have been driven to a bit of a corner by their own right wing, and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they may have to blow up first. Uh, maybe and that could. Ha you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but that you know, as long as they're driven into the cul-de-sac by their big donors and by their big money, you know, again, there's a lot of that more going on, on the Republican side than the Democratic side, and. In some respects, a lot of these House Republicans vote the way they do because they don't want to get attacked from the right. And so that's the dilemma they live in. Mm -hmm. It may suggest that opportunities for more uh, you know, community organizing and advocacy, particularly in rural communities, you know, oh, yeah. where there are these opportunities to raise up these issues and to maybe break down these ideological walls. I agree. Any uh, audience questions? Good. Yeah, we have one from Sean. What sort of influence have food policy councils had over the farm bill process, current or past? Have food system specialists been involved regarding food sovereignty, environment, health? We have another question, but I think uh, we'll, start we'll start with that one. Uh, Adam or Chris, do you want to take that food policy council question? I, uh, you may not have enough information. I, maybe you do, Chris. Well, I mean, I doing the work on my, on my book. I mean, I, they came up a, a couple times, uh, especially in the Senate, in the context of the Senate. I mean, again, uh, more expansive set of voices that would pop up, but not just the Senate. I mean, I, I was reading the House Agriculture Committee's hearings, and you know, you'd have representation not at the at the actual hearings themselves, but when they open up for online commentary, there would be people from food policy councils. You know, doing online commentary, but so the, there's not been necessarily structured representation on the House side. A little bit more on the Senate side. Again, broader array of constituencies showing up at Senate Ag Committee meetings, uh, hearings than on the House side. Um, so you know there was some, but again, it tended not to be through the lens of food policy councils and more through the lens of organic, local, um, you know, you know, and other themes. Not so much food policy mm -hmm. councils as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was speaking just for myself, our, I'm a member of the Santa Fe Food Policy Council in New Mexico, and uh, we regularly weigh in on federal policy issues, including the Farm Bill, including going to both our city council and our board of county commissioners, asking them to pass resolutions in, fa in favor of certain aspects of the Farm Bill. So there's, there are opportunities to do that. Adam, did you have I, I don't have a whole lot to add there. Other than this? You know, I just think, um, you know, my sense is that the potential hasn't been fully tapped. I mean, that, um, you know, that uh, it's, an, it's a question about how, um, how might food policy councils be more 
effective in the future as a coalition that joins together across the United States because there are now are so many and they share some uh, similar concerns. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, historically we've seen that organizations that have a kind of federated structure with representation in lots of in, in, in individual states, that's how the Farm Bureau, for example, became very powerful. That's what allowed them to simultaneously pressure many members of Congress. And it would be interesting for, the, for these various food policy councils to get together and think about not only working individually in their communities, their states or regions, but also how to construct a national coalition through the connections of food policy councils that would maybe allow them to speak with a more singular voice on some of these issues. Yeah, some, some good thoughts there for organizing. It should be, maybe be more like the Farm Bureau, which would be interesting. Yeah, and, uh, and remember, the structure of Congress really rep structures representation. So right. if you're going to organize, pay attention to House district lines. You know, you got to pay attention to actually, you know, you know, who your who's your representative. That's right. I mean, I think I, I think for you know to provide an example uh, where where I think uh, a positive example is that uh, you know once the uh, the U.S. Council of Mayors sort of put the farm bill on their radar and then began to speak around around these issues i think that uh, i think that did have a positive effect on yeah. um, on wa on, the, on yeah. what was going on in washington and so again i think that's an example where there are there are existing um, vehicles for uh, these groups or individuals across the united states to try to pull the discussion a little bit more towards the concerns of uh, community food security and, and the like. Yeah, let, let me echo that because uh, the Boston Food Access Council, in which I'm a, I'm, a, 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 I'm a member, you know, we spent a fair bit of time, and not just because of me, but we spent a fair bit of time you know, earlier this year talking about the uh, National Conference of Mayors, which had this meeting in Boston recently, and making sure that food issues were on the agenda of the, of the mm -hmm. mayors, and that you know, SNAP, but also broader food issues. So um, again, you know, urban mayors are a huge uh, you know, potential uh, for you know, coalition building because they care about uh, the breadth of these issues, not just food access, but the breadth of these broader food issues increasingly. Good. Okay. We had another question. Yeah. What does the da data say about how well or not, maybe not so well, farm subsidies or SNAP provide long term benefits? Yeah, I, I can take those. I mean, so. Um, Did you hear you know, that? The, the research on SNAP or on nutrition programs is that they do provide enormous long-term benefits. Um, there's been a series of very important papers written by economists that have looked at, for example, uh, the effect of, of nutrition programs uh, on the first cohort of children in the 1970s um, who were uh, uh, of, of the first generation who were able to, um, to benefit from from food those food programs and comparing those to similar kids um, in uh, counties where the rollout of, of food programs was slower so you have kind of natural experiment where you can compare the kids that had access to nutrition programs with those that didn't and the kids who had access to nutrition programs 30 40 years later were doing better than the kids who didn't have access to those nutrition programs so there's actually a wealth of research to show that that food stamps and nutrition programs really help kids a lot in terms of their health, their, their educational attainment, their uh, long run uh, income, for example. As far as um, the data on farm programs, I mean, I think that's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag in so far as um, there's no question that farm subsidies have contributed to our cheap food system. And, um, and by that, I mean a food system in which um, sugar and fat is, is so cheap, and obviously that contributes to diet-related disease. On the other hand, it's very difficult to say that if you eliminated all the subsidies that we currently provide those commodities, that it would alter the, the food system in a significant way because these are global products and these, the food industry would source these uh, raw materials from other places and so and and also because the price effects of these subsidies on the consumer bill food bill is very small you know 10 cents out of your dollar is actually going to the producer that it's not clear that changing these subsidies would radically alter 
the food system. Again, having said that, there's no question that there's a relationship there and that we might have other reasons why we'd like to prioritize a different form of production, particularly because of the environmental consequences of industrial agriculture and the like. But in terms of the diet-related effects, it's, it's hard to draw a clear connection between subsidies and, for example, diet-related disease. Yeah, I agree with that, and 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 I mean, yeah, the you start that, to drive, drive. Sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Chris. Just echoing, I mean, you know, we, we forget, we think that subsidies equal the, you know, cheap food system, but in many cases, the mere effect of industrial scale. I mean, that we've got really efficient, really good farming going on, uh, and so you know, these the subsidies may create perverse incentives. But the fact that we've got the kind of food, you know, production system we have would still continue without the subsidies. Right. Absolutely. Right. Anything else, Rachel or Ann? No other questions right now. If people, oh, here we go. Um, someone said, aren't the cheap prices of commodities due to overproduction and the dismantling of supply management strategies than subsidies? Yes. I mean, that's, that was the strategy being in the 70s, being with Earl Butts, you know, plant head, head to a defense row, you know, and, and, and we'll take care of it by consumption and by exports. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I tell my students all the time, we've got, you know, the natural consequence is glut, surpluses. So the food has to go somewhere. And that sort of, and as Adams pointed out, when you have overproduction, you get, you know, you know the, the cost of the commodities just drop, yeah. you know. I mean, the, the only thing I would add there is that um, if you were to look at a long-term trend of real inflation-adjusted prices for corn, the decline begins well before the elimination of, of, these pro, of these supply controls. So it's correct that with supply controls, you might have higher prices, but it's also important to remember this enormous transformation in production through industrial inputs, machinery, chemicals, hybrid seeds, even before genetic engineering, hybrid seeds that increase the, the output per unit of land, the yields, and that's also what has put downward pressure on prices. So, um, so that process really began earlier um, and, um, and I think is, is hard to imagine reversing even, even if we had you know, supply controls. There, uh, anything else from the audience? Not right now. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you both to, if you want to make a, a a closing statement. But in doing that, I I'd, I'd ask you to think about the future, uh, where we go from here. Uh, we it seems like we've had some good thoughts around what new coalitions might look like, uh, opening up some space that, that had previously been closed off by you know narrow thinking, perhaps um, not recognizing common interests. But you know, looking ahead uh, for our audience, what would some of your suggestions be about what a future might future? You know, we, these farm bills every five years, more or less. So if we don't get it right this time, and I'm sure we're not going to get it perfectly right, what are some of the things, steps we might take looking ahead? Uh, the big question. I'll take. A, I guess I'll take a first crack at that. I mean, part, partly is to is to maybe um, uh, uh, go back to a couple of things that I've, that I've already said. One is that um, this farm bill is going to include uh, funding for these smaller programs that benefit um, uh, advocates working in local communities. And it's important at this stage of the process to remind your, your elected officials uh, how important those programs are to you and to your um, to your communities and to make sure that they that they fight to, to keep those in the farm bill um, I think in the longer term um, as as Chris pointed out um, Farm bill politics would look much different with Democratic majorities in the House and Senate So working towards Democratic majorities would also have the possibility of, uh, of advancing a different agenda around food and agriculture and then and then I and then I guess the last point I would make is um, you know, things that I, I, I know people are doing now around kind of regional food systems is, you know, building those links between um, largely urban consumers and then uh, smaller producers in the um, rural and exurban areas around, you know, within these kind of broader regional food sheds. And the, they obviously there's a common interest around access to markets and things like that, but there may be opportunities to build 
um, common interests around larger political concerns like rural development and the like, which may lead to you know, electing Democratic office holders from those parts of the United States, as well as being able to join up these um, uh, these really robust food policy councils across the United States to set forward an agenda that places more emphasis on on uh, kind of regional concerns, uh, food access concerns, um, helping small producers, um, and sort of shifting it away from the kind of um, uh, big ag focus of the farm bill. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you, Chris. Any final thoughts? Yeah, let me add. A, I mean, add a, I think in terms of the future, I mean, I think you know, continuing to do what you're doing. I mean, I, one thing I've noted is that you know, for example, in Massachusetts, we have a statewide food policy council, which is an official body, and I was there talking about the farm bill a couple months ago. And and what and what you notice is that in places like Massachusetts, maybe and maybe it's just New England thing, but the gap between urban consumers and farmers is very tight. It's very small. There's a lot more farm to table kinds of activities going on, a lot mm -hmm. more understanding of SNAP in nutrition, but also in as supporting farmers, a lot more understanding of the connections here. And I think opportunities in the food policy council spaces to get farmers, local producers involved, to you know, get those conversations going, to change the narratives about the farm bill away from the traditional big ag, big commodity, and more toward a food system dis discourse that connects mm -hmm. people together. I think those opportunities exist. There's a lot of farmers out there for whom the farm bill does not work. They're too small, they don't grow the right crops, the insurance uh, premiums are too expensive. And you know, I've, I've talked to them and, and, and there's an opportunity there for us eaters, for consumers, to, to connect to the producers, you know, who are not being served by the current system. Thank you. So I think we're gonna bring this to a close right now. Uh, Adam and Chris, thank you both very much. I'm, you are clearly, you clearly confirmed my, my statement that you are the top two uh, political scientists <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, around the farm bill anyway, in America. So uh, thank you both for coming and sharing some really thoughtful insights. I think I've learned a lot and I hope our audience has picked up some good tips that they can put into action as well. So I'm gonna have to kick it back to Ann and Rachel for a moment just to wrap it up. Great, thanks again everyone for attending. Um, we'll be sharing the, the slides and the link to this recording later so you can share with your Food Policy Council friends and others as well. Um, we know that attendance during the summer is a little bit more challenging, but we know that a lot of people signed up for this webinar, so we're excited to share it with them too. Thanks, Thank you guys. all. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye.